The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Arts Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazines. Today, Urban Pastel Painting with Nancy King Mertz. Enjoy. Hi everyone, I'm Nancy King Mertz and I'm going to uh, share with you some of my techniques for pastel. Use values and color and the calligraphy with a positive and negative space to make it work. I made this box that holds both of the pastel sets that are signature pastel sets from the Richardson Company. They're the Nancy King Mertz Urban Set and the Nancy King Mertz Atmospheric Landscape Set. So I, they sent me pastels to select 80 for each set and I've merged them, and I put all the, the cool colors together and all the warm colors together so that I can quickly grab what I need. But it is two separate sets merged together in, in the box. But you can, if you're starting out, you can get along just fine with one set, and that'll take you a long way until you feel like you don't have quite the right colors, and then you might want to add, add more. I also use um, their hard pastels and keep them with me. They're, it's great for um, filling in some tighter areas or doing windows in uh, a city scene. I do lots and lots of urban work, so I'm always uh, you know, putting windows in skyscrapers, and I, I try not to paint each window, but I, I do an underwash, uh, which kind of gives me the tone I need, and then go lightly around with uh, the hard pastel. So those are in this box. And let me share with you the box I made, which is like a portable table for the pastels. And rubber bands are my friends. So whether you, uh, well, anytime you travel with your pastels, be sure to secure them with a rubber band or clips or tape or something because there's nothing worse than getting to a location and finding your pastels all down in the bottom in a heap, a dusty heap. So this I made um, just out of coroplast, which is a corrugated plastic. I simply scored it with a, a knife and um, attached wood on the bottom. And there's a quick coupling device that is part of my tripod easel. It's a camera tripod easel. And um, I didn't want the, the screws to poke through, so I used big washers. And it's just, it's, it weighs nothing at all, so it's great. I came up with this idea when I went to Cuba with the um, 100 painters from Planner Magazine. And we were limited to 42 pounds, so I came up with a, a small box and it, it worked great. So, 
So this is the atmospheric set merged with urban set. And then uh, this is the second set merged. And then I keep the hard ones in between. Um, and I'm painting on a mounted UART paper. I have a frame shop, so I have the luxury of, of a dry mount press. So I use archival tissue, and it's mounted on uh, rag board, eight ply rag board, which is very rigid. For years, I used gator board because um, I didn't want the warpage that you would get from archival foam core. So I thought gator board was the answer, and found that it's very, very acidic. So I, I have switched to the rag board. So that's just like this. There's archival tissue that, that mounts it to the board. And then everything fits in a pack that I, this is our store, um, fits in a pack that I carry over my shoulder onto the plane um, after I've wrapped everything in wax paper or glycine paper and painter's tape to protect it. And I try to always have two panels the same size so that they can be put together to protect each other. Sometimes I'll put coins at each corner to separate them a little bit, but the, the wax paper is in there. Um, but someone did say that if you're in a hot climate, wax paper may not work too well because it, it could potentially melt. So. Glycine would be the answer if you're in a warm climate. But I live in Chicago, so it's not always warm there, <laughs> especially right now. So I always start with um, a little tick mark map, that's what I call it. So it's just a, a charcoal drawing of a map, and um, I then work from dark to light. So I apply the darks. And then I wash them in with denatured alcohol. And um, that type of alcohol you can get at the hardware store. And it's very inexpensive. Um, it doesn't have any oil in it. There could be a little oil in um, like rubbing alcohol that is medicinal. So I use the denatured alcohol. And it's, it doesn't have water in it either, so it's not diluted. And it dries immediately, especially if you're outside. It's, it's great for outside. So. That's kind of my process. So I will start with, um, I also use the vine charcoal. Uh, this is the richest in charcoal. I really like that. And I don't need such a big piece. So I just start in. Um, this image is all about vanishing points. And it's, it's all you know like one point perspective. And I, I don't want it to be smack dab in the middle. So I'm going to start with it over to the side here. This is helping me get, um, I have kind of a crooked piece here. Let me see if I can switch. And I'm not really, you know, drawing with the charcoal. I'm just kind of hitting the surface to give me directional lines. Again, my tick mark map. So you can see that, that I've made the point of the one-point perspective a little off-center. So if, if it were right in the center, it would be there. So we don't want a bullseye, so I've just moved it off. So I'm thinking about you know, where that's going to end up. There's going to be lots of light around that, light out here. And then this will be fairly dark 
leading up to that point. So it's going to be such an obvious center of interest that I wanted to be really careful about getting it off center. So always be thinking about, you know, when you start, where's your, your center of interest going to be? And because it's the center of interest, don't put it in the center. Make your composition more interesting by moving it off to the side in some way, or up high, or down low, or but just keep it, you know, somewhere out of the middle. Okay, so now I am going to put in some of the darks. And I know this looks like a complicated composition for a pastel basics, but I'm hoping that my method will show you how quickly you can achieve some of this. And your brush, um, I use a, a Gray Matters fan brush from Richardson. This is a number six. Your brush will do some of the work for you because it can, once I put the alcohol on this, it will help with the directional lines and some of those lines will remain throughout the painting. So this is how the brush starts <laughs> and this is, you know, this is after many, many uses. So I've found that the Gray Matters Richardson brush is the most durable of all. Some of my brushes ended up looking like a handlebar mustache because they would wear away in the middle. But um, this one's really durable, so it's my favorite. Another thing that I like about this Richardson set is that each piece has a little cubby. It not only protects them when you're traveling, but as you use a piece, you can keep it tilted up so you'll know to go back to that. Helps you keep track of the pigments you're using. And often, I say pigments because these are pure pigments. Often people will say, oh, you're painting in chalk. And it's interesting, um, families will be walking by and, and you know, the mom will say, oh, kids, look, she's painting in chalk. And the kids will say, no, mom, it's pastel. So I'm glad they're teaching that to kids in school um, because chalk has a lot of limestone in it and uh, different binders and so forth and and just dyes it's not pigment and this is the same pigment that's in oil it just doesn't have the oil in it there's maybe a little bit of a binder in here to keep it in stick form but it's it's simply ground pure pigment compressed into a stick and it's a derivative pastel is a derivative of a French word meaning paste so it can become a paste if you really grind it in. And I tend to grind in the lights. So you, you use the darks with a lighter hand. The beauty of pastels is you can layer over them. Um, and you don't have to wait for things to dry. Um, and they don't sink in like uh, some oils can, or they don't fade like watercolor can fade. So what you see is what you get. Okay. And I'm sticking with the darks. If you start introducing the lights too soon, and um, you know we're going to wash this in and, and really 
um, make the darks adhere to the board. Um, if you get the lights in there, then you get kind of a muddy result. So save your lights for later. And you'll have a much better result. And again, I'm just kind of slapping it on here. Um, I do paint loosely, but especially at this stage, you want to keep it loose. You don't want to start thinking about details and you just want to get the, the values in at this point and the dark values, especially at this point. So soon I'm going to start washing in with the alcohol because we're getting the darks in there. Okay, so I keep the denatured alcohol in a flask, and I have to check this in my luggage, so I keep it inside a plastic bag so it doesn't leak all over my clothes. Um, and then I just use a peanut butter jar and just pour a little bit out. It evaporates very quickly, so you don't want to have a, like a bucket of it sitting by you because it, it'll be gone. And this is when I'm out painting and people are watching, this is when they leave because they think, oh my gosh, she was doing okay until she did this. Because <laughs> it makes a mess and people can't figure out what you're doing. But it's part of the process. And some of these strokes, you know, make sure you get them going in the proper direction because they can be helpful in your final painting. And it just reinforces your perspective. Keeps you on the right track, so to speak. And drips are okay because you can cover those with your lights. Okay, so I'll let that dry. You can get some, you know, very light tones in there too just by moving some of the pigment around. So I want to save it. It's okay that it's dirty. You can just pour it back in the flask. So I have to let that dry. 
And I always tell people to edit as they go, especially when they're plein air painting. Um, so often there's a tree in the way or whatever. And you want to just look around that if, if it's right in the middle of your composition. If, if you're looking across the river at a, a beautiful scene and there's a tree there, just you know, either move or, or pretend the tree is not there. So it's, it's your painting, so it's fine if you edit. You don't have to include everything. You don't have to include you know, every stoplight or street sign or um, lamp post that you see. So I, I often warn people to beware of the rhinoceros. Um, the rhinoceros who had his painting studio, and every painting in his studio had the rhinoceros horn in it. <laughs> so he didn't know how to edit, so be sure to edit as you, as you come up with your composition. And also people will say when they're painting something that might have a uh, pot of flowers in, in the landscape or whatever, they neglect to get uh, the foundation in there. They want to start painting the pot of flowers. So I'll tell them that you know you can't put the kitchen cabinets on until you have the two by fours and the drywall in place. So get your foundation in first. And then, especially with pastel, you can go right over and add those elements that really attracted you to the scene. But save yourself. It's like dessert. Save yourself for that. Okay, we're getting dry. All right. So now I can use a little more color and And sometimes I'll do the alcohol again if it's needed. I'm going to punch that up a little bit. It's a little light at this stage. I want to stay in the mid-tones and dark still. I keep looking down because I am referring to an image that's below, so. And this was not a plein air piece originally. It was a uh, I was driving, <laughs> it's terrible, I was driving and taking photos um, under the L. And so this is a, from my camera. So I love to paint bridges and cruddy things that have interesting rust and so forth on them. So the, I love the calligraphy that structures make, um, you know, the, the negative space becomes as important as the positive space. So always look for that when you're looking at structures. Just notice how the negative space becomes uh, crucial to the composition. Again, I'm not laboriously drawing this. I'm 
just kind of hitting it with the side of the pastel. Again, to keep it loose. Um, you definitely want to be loose early on. And just think about the shapes and the values at this point. And I don't, um, I take the labels off of my pastels so I can't report to you what color I'm using or what number. Um, I just, I grab the stick that I feel is necessary for the, the area. So it, it helps to have a nice assortment of color. And some pastels are very organized and they write down all the numbers and keep track and reorder the ones that are getting low or broken or whatever, but I just get another set if I need it. I think that you know, after years of plein air painting, it just has made me make quick decisions while I'm working, whether I'm in the studio or outdoors. And it helps you see color so much better that you, you can take that knowledge back to your studio. So instead of um, painting the darks black, which they are in the photo, you learn to substitute real color that makes the painting much more vibrant and interesting. And pastels provide a, a brilliance that you can't get with a lot of mediums. It's, it's just a great medium to use for studio or plein air. Okay, it's starting to look like a the L, long way to go, but starting to be identifiable. cars over in this section, so I'll just give little dark notes to indicate that. I don't have black in this set, on either set, and I think black is fine if you use it sparingly and if you don't let it become your shadow color. But there are times when you do need black, like if you're painting a lamppost that has, you know, black column. Um, but instead I use a little bit of charcoal at times and it's a very soft black, so it works for me. Cassat, Degas, these are just a sampling of the artists who have captured our imaginations with their beautiful and inspiring pastel paintings. In fact, throughout history, pastel paintings have made up many of our most powerful and truly iconic pieces of art, including the Buddha, Before the Race, and the Degas classic, After the Bath, Woman Drying Herself. Though it's not just art connoisseurs who marvel at such work, people with no great interest in art also view pastel paintings with a look of awe. The rich textures, the deep colors, all are so satisfying to the eye. Now in the 21st century, unique urban paintings are among some of the most popular works of pastel art. After all, there aren't many things more fulfilling than bringing the excitement of the urban landscape to life. In this all-new, exclusive release from Lilladal Art Instruction Videos, you have the rare opportunity to follow along step-by-step 
with one of the most talented masters of urban pastel painting, Nancy King Mertz, will show you how to breathe life into a wonderful urban landscape scene. You'll discover composition tips for unique urban paintings, how to layer colors for rich results, negative painting techniques which can take your work to a whole new level, and much, much more. Learning to paint an urban pastel painting is one of the easiest ways to accelerate your learning process as a painter. And this all-new release is perfect for artists of all skill levels. Urban Pastel Painting with Nancy King Mertz is now available on both DVD and streaming video. Well, that was Urban Pastel Painting with Nancy King Mertz, who loves to paint in the city of Chicago. You can learn more about the video at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount code for you today only in the comments section. Now, let's get right to our interview with Nancy. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes from Plein Air Magazine and Fine Art Connoisseur and Artist on Art Magazines. And today we have a real celebrity in the house. <laughs> <laughs> we have Nancy King Mertz, uh, one of the premier pastel painters in America. Nancy, welcome. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm so honored to have this time with you. You and I have had a little time this week to get to know each other and, uh, and, and learn about each other. And you have a fascinating story and it's really something that needs to be shared with everybody. So we're going to just kind of go through the whole thing, soup to nuts, and see what we can learn about you. How about that? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So how did this whole uh, interest in art begin for you? Well, my parents always said my first sentence was, I want an easel. So I don't <laughs> think that's true, but um, I just had an interest at a very, very young age. And I grew up in a tiny town, and they took me to the next tiny town that had an art instructor each week, and I would take classes there. What age were uh, you at that time? Uh, very young. I mean, I, I have those little paintings that I did when I was very, very young. Uh, probably six, five, six. Oh, really? Yeah. That's pretty young. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I always had lots of art materials at uh, my disposal as I was growing up. And then um, started painting in oil in high school and started taking extension classes from the University of Illinois, which was about 30 miles away So you in live, high school. So you live in Chicago right now. Yeah, but grew but, up in central Illinois. So tell us the small town that you grew up in. Arcola, Illinois. Arcola? Mm -hmm. A-R-C-O-L-A? Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also an Arcola, Indiana. Yes, sir. And also Arcola, Texas, I think. There probably Maybe. is an Arcola in every... I think so. It's kind of yeah. like Amco, you know, you want to be first in the phone book. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then what was the small town that you went to for your Tescola. lessons? Tescola. Tescola. <laughs> and then, uh, do you remember the name of the instructor? Uh, Miss Whitaker, I believe was her name. Wow, good memory. Yeah. <laughs> probably haven't thought about that in years. <laughs> <laughs> so you went to high school and then you started taking extension classes. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Um, it was great because I was following my passion and um, able to kind of get a jump start on some college credit. That's where I went to school, University of Illinois, and studied painting. Is that Carbondale? No, that's Champaign. Champaign. So okay. that was 30 miles north. So I kept going north for my art instruction. <laughs> You're going to end up in uh, Minnesota before <laughs> yeah, we know it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that was a great experience and I had great instructors at University of Illinois and met my husband there okay. and we married just as soon as I graduated and moved to Milwaukee couldn't find a job it was like a real bad you're, time for a job search you're trying to find a job doing what uh, well I was dressing windows at a department store and okay. Ron was looking for a job and couldn't find anything so we moved back to Arcola he was offered a job there and I thought well I think I can afford to take a graduate class in painting. So I drove down to Eastern Illinois University, which is like 20 miles away, and enrolled in the one class I thought I could afford. And as I was leaving, the dean of the college came, the graduate school came running after me and he said, we will pay full tuition if you'll be a graduate assistant. Really? So a year and a half later, I had my master's degree in painting. And then they asked me to serve on faculty for a year and a half, and I did that. But I'd also 
at the same time, um, started a framing shop and gallery in Arcola, and, which is a big tourist town because of the Amish population that's there. So um, my business venture won out. So Yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious about this, so I just have to play this back. So back in the day, I, I know it really wasn't that long ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, you know, you hear a lot of stories from artists who had a lot of, they had a difficult time getting, uh, being able to do representational work because there was a lot of modernism going right. on. And I assume that you probably encountered a little of that too. Yes? Most definitely. Especially in undergraduate school because it was, um, you know, I, there's a small town kid and I, I was actually doing plein air painting then. I didn't know what it was called, but I just always painted what I could see. You know, mm -hmm. I'd set up a still life or I'd go out in the country and paint. Um, and then here were all these kids from huge schools in Chicago that were at the university that were doing all these really wild, crazy things. Avant-garde kind yeah, of things. Yeah. yeah, and it was hard for me to relate, but I had some great instructors. I had a terrific instructor who was, um, head of the architecture department, and I took a full year of architecture classes. Did you really? And that helped so much with and, my and, drawing. And, and why? I just wanted to be able to draw buildings correctly and understand perspective and um, how shadows are affected by perspective. And so, so that, may, that may, may explain why you're not so intimidated by some of the urban scenes, which are yeah. from a perspective standpoint can be mm -hmm. a nightmare, right? Mm -hmm. Because of all the different angles and, and things like that. So that's really something that really helped you. Yeah. I, I would have not thought that, you know, it, I, I clearly think that drawing is critical for any artist yeah. to study, but you don't think in terms of architectural drawing. Mm -hmm. But I look at, at things that some people do uh, that their architecture just is so far ahead of everybody else's. So is it perspective or is there something else to it? Well, I think a, a thorough knowledge of perspective is really important, but it, it kind of becomes intuitive after you've done it for so many years, you know, so you don't think about it so much. Um, but it, it's a lot of the value relationships, too. I think, you know, when you see a really beautifully drawn architectural piece, the values are spot on. Too. So I'm going to stop there because there are beginners who might be watching this who don't know what the heck a value is. Oh. They're going to think in terms of family values. Oh, okay. So would you explain that just for their benefit and, and our patience to the people who already know? But can, can you articulate that for us just a little tiny bit? Well, value is um, the color from, or not really, well, yes, it's applied to color, but from white to black, from light to dark, and you know the different steps of the stages tone. of the tones. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And then, of course, once you learn the tones, you also have to figure out how to look at color and learn the tones. Mm -hmm. And if you have the value correct, you can paint something any color you want. You can really play with color. I tend to paint in local color, um, which means the color of the object. You know, like if I were painting you, I'd paint you with a blue shirt and a black jacket. But someone who wants to experiment with color might put you in purple and green, but if yeah. they get the I value purple, right... I wear purple and green frequently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's your, your color. Yeah. Um, if they get the value correct, then, you know, the color works. Well, that's so. really one of the principles of, of painting is that if you... It, you can do a beautiful painting in black and white Right. or brown and white, or green and white, or blue and white. <clears throat> and, it, and, and those paintings, if it's a good painting, if the values are right, those paintings will sell. And we, we both know artists, Charlie Hunter, for instance, yeah. who basically does everything in, in you know black and white, or green mm -hmm. and white, or brown and white. And so I think that's an important lesson for everybody, especially beginners, to understand is that if they can study those values, mm -hmm that that will make a huge difference in their in their life as a painter. When I first started painting, I didn't want to do that, right? Because I wanted to get right to color, because color's fun and exciting, and gray and black is just not all that exciting. Mm -hmm. But um, my first instructor just beat that into my head, and he said, look, you're going to do this over and over and over again, 
And then you're going to do it once a year for the rest of your life. You're going to do at least one grayscale painting the rest of your life. And I don't. You don't. <laughs> he may be turning over in his grave. But I do. I do quite a few of them now. Not that I'm not. I don't. I'm not here to talk about me. But anyway, so uh, perspective is a little bit hard, a little bit intimidating for people to learn. And if you're outside and you've got all this stuff going on, mm -hmm. and you've got all these angles of houses and bridges and all of that stuff, how do you figure out where your horizon line is? That's the first question. And then the second question is, uh, when, you're, when you're at your horizon line, do roofs go up and then they go down below the horizon line? Is that essentially? It, it depends on, you know, how, depends on where how it's I, constructed. But, you know, I always tell my students to determine you know where their horizon line is they're typically standing and so the horizon line is often eye level or a little below and then I just have them hold out a ruler or some kind of straight edge even a paintbrush and get the correct angle and then translate that or transfer that angle to their their surface and, well, that's and cheating. I can see the light bulb that's cheating why is it cheating no, it's not cheating <laughs> it's, it's, it, what it does is it simplifies the process mm -hmm. And after I learned that, it, it, it was like, okay, hold the ruler here and then just move it over to the canvas. Mm -hmm. So do you do sight size painting? Uh, meaning, sight size meaning that you set your canvas up identically side by side with exactly the scene. So if the horizon line is here oh, in the no. scene, you take it all the way across your canvas. That means I, getting your canvas at eye level. Yeah, No, I don't. I am always in such a rush to get started. <laughs> I, I don't do thumbnails and I don't do no tans, which I know a lot of instructors insist that students do. But I do what I call a tick mark map. So I set up my canvas and um, I just use a piece of vine charcoal and usually about this long and I'll even just lay it against the sanded paper and a pastel and you know it, it picks up the angle that I want. I can check perspective with that um, it sets boundaries so that I'm if you know if you start painting you end up without enough surface to paint on you know you get your scale gets too big or whatever and you're clear off here but if I do the tick mark map that kind of guides me keeps the composition contained and so I have I really have the drawing down with like in five or ten minutes I think by just really important. doing that so a lot of this, a lot of beginners, and quite frankly, a lot of uh, non-beginners, their their paintings will wander, right? So they have they've defined that okay, the edge of this building is going to be where my end of my canvas is, and the edge of this tree is going to be where the other end mm -hmm. is, and then before you know it, it's creeping out and creeping mm -hmm. out and creeping out. Mm -hmm. So how do you prevent that from happening? I I just use the map. I just swear by that that yeah. map that I so get I rely get on. get your boundaries in. And don't ever change them. Once you get your kind of initial sketch in, then you're yeah, you fixed I'm, it. I'm good to go. Yeah. yeah. So you do a lot of teaching. You do a lot of workshops. You were telling me uh, that you recently returned from Europe, from Croatia, and from Venice, uh, where you had a workshop. And mm -hmm. you're doing about ten workshops a year. Uh, is that right? Next year I have ten. Ten yeah. year. Yeah, that's a lot. So, what are the things that? What are the most common mistakes that beginners make? What are the most common things that need to be corrected? Well, so many will say to me, um, I have these beautiful pastels, but I don't want to touch them because I'm not good enough. And I'll say, well, you're not going to get good until you use good materials. So I always encourage people to use the best materials they can. And, um, you know, your results are so much better. So but how you do you know? Because a beginner painter when they walk into an art store, they don't know the difference. And I didn't know the difference for many years. And I, when I was painting, I'd just go buy the cheapest paint I could find. And this brown is five bucks and this brown is 10 bucks. I'm going to pick the $5 one. So how do you know? What, how do you train students to understand that? It's just, it's so sad when somebody comes to class and they have just a really cheap set of pastels or oils. I, I tend to do most of my teaching in pastel, but um, it everything just rides on the surface, and there's no you can't get any depth, you can't get any um, 
reaction between the surface and the the pastel if the materials are just cheap and they're it's it's just a binder that has uh, some color in it you know mm -hmm. it's not the pure pigment that that good pastels are soft pastels are. Yeah. well and I found that to be the case with oil paints right yeah. you have student grade paints and they they oftentimes don't say that it's student grade but you look at the price, and so finally I had an instructor one day who just took all my paint, and he said, you know, I'm throwing it, off, yeah. throwing it all out. And he said, now here, try my paint. And the difference was so dramatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your brush reacts differently, and um, the solvents react differently, so it's, it's so, so important to have decent yeah. materials. You don't yeah. have to buy the best, but you have to buy decent materials, or yeah. you're just fighting yourself. Right, causing and, trouble. And no instructor can help you get better right. if you have crummy material. Well, and that starts with a canvas. Um, yeah, obviously in pastel you're using paper mm -hmm. mounted on a board, but it starts with canvas because, you know, you go to one of these craft stores and you see a bundle of 10 canvases for 20 bucks and you think, ooh, I hit the mm -hmm. jackpot, but mm -hmm. you try to paint on those things and, you know, it's... It kind of rolls off. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just kind of nothing sticks. Yeah. yeah. So I want to go back. Uh, we we kind of didn't finish up the where you kind of came from. You um, so you did the teaching gig for a couple of years, and then what happened? You left the small town and went back to Chicago. Well, um, I had gallery and frame shop in the small town for twelve years. Oh, you did. Yeah, and my husband went back to school, got his master's in accounting, and then he was hired by one of the big eight accounting firms at that time in Chicago. So we moved to Chicago. Um, I kept the framing business and I would service it downstate once a month and do the work in Chicago and then take it back and pick up a new batch and, as I was building the business in Chicago. So and, you, I didn't understand that. So you opened a, a frame shop in Chicago as well? Well, not until later. Okay. I was, we had a... Uh, you're really? kind of working just kind of friends and family just doing framing for that kind of thing? Well, I, I kept all my customers downstate. Yeah. Um, it was a, a frame shop gallery, and it was when the the country craft rate was like, <laughs> just everybody was frantic about country stuff, and I thought if I never see a painted horse again, I'll be <laughs> cut out of wood. I'll be so happy. <laughs> so I sold that part of the business but kept the framing business and would go back to that shop once a month and pick up a new batch of framing, you know, do it in Chicago in my studio there, and then bring it back and pick up a new batch. So I was building uh, friendships, relationships in Chicago, and people were having me frame things, and some artists were um, having me frame things in Chicago. And I was working out of our loft, which was zoned commercial, so I was able to have a business there and uh, did that for several years, just working out of mm -hmm. our home. Without a storefront. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, the economy started slowing down and my husband decided to um, start doing prints and cards in my work. So he just quit his job <laughs> and he said, let's see how this works. So after about three years of not getting a lot of inner internet sales, um, we found a retail space. And so we've had a, a gallery, frame shop, print, cards, originals, now do you, right by our house. Do you carry other artists other than yourself? We don't. When we first opened, we did. Mm -hmm. And um, I just paint a lot. And I needed more wall space. And then we actually doubled our, our storefront in 2008. And... Um, operated that way for quite some time. And then I started teaching a lot, mm -hmm. and it was hard to run two storefronts, even though they're connected, and the frame shop, and be gone and teach. And um, had a lot of family obligations then, too. I had a mother that needed a lot of attention. So um, we just closed the other side and have the single shop now. So knowing what you know now, uh, if somebody is an artist who's thinking about opening up their own art gallery, um, would you recommend they do it? Would you discourage them? Um, only if they're willing to put their heart and soul and 
you know, 80 hours a week into it. I, I just work all the time because I have to keep the shop filled with originals and um, my husband's always photographing what I paint and doing prints and cards and so forth and, and so we both work a lot. We work close to each other, you know, under the same roof, but um, it's just a lot of a lot of hours and if you're willing to do that, well, I go think for that, it. I think a lot of artists um, think that uh, when it comes to their marketing or their building their, their business aspect, uh, that they can cruise. And, mm. uh, you know, the, the word business or the word marketing to a lot of artists is evil. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want to hear it, but you've learned it's not that way at all. It's been very good to you. Yeah, and I think, you know, I cut my teeth on marketing when I opened my shop right after we were married. And... Um, we were in a busy tourist area, and I was uh, I was even managing the building that our shop was in. It was a, a bunch of little shops that were in a very cool building. So anyway, um, I just learned a lot of marketing techniques through that, and um, you know now with the internet, it's so much easier to to get the word out, and yeah. you know you're not spending as much on print and. Or, or mailing. I, print is a good thing. Yeah, I do. I do spend money on print. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> I say do that. buy those ads. But. Well, I, I think the, <clears throat> I think one of the misperceptions, uh, and it, especially um, from certain sectors, is the misperception is because I have social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever it is that you're using, that that becomes your marketing. And what tends to happen, not always, is first off, I use it a lot. I, I, I use it for marketing, I use it for advertising, I do a lot of things in it. But that's not the only thing I, I do because I never want to have my, my business on a single pillar. Right. Right. Because, uh, you know, there's been, uh, as a matter of fact, I was just reading something uh, that uh, they're trying to outlaw advertising on the internet in the EU countries. Hmm. And imagine how that would kill thousands, hundreds yeah. of thousands, millions of businesses overnight if that happened. And if you had all of your um, advertising based on one particular pillar and that pillar came crashing down, then you would, you would lose. But also you have to be hitting different people in different places because we assume that everybody sees every Facebook post, yet the average person only sees 7% right. of I your Facebook posts. I read that. And so there's recently. a lot of, you know, there's a lot of misnomers about it. And of course, it's not always the right people that you're reaching and so mm -hmm. on. So, but if you had to kind of boil it down for someone who might be an accomplished artist or getting ready to sell their work or something, are there maybe two or three things that you found were really essential when it came to marketing as an artist? Well, um, I've always been real active in the community. I joined the Chamber of Commerce and the two neighborhoods that we're um, in, and uh, you know, I, I just am always out there networking, and um, I do a lot of e-blasts. Um, well, I would say not a lot, but at least twice a month I'm doing an e-blast, and I have a, a really extensive e-blast list. Uh, used to do a lot of direct mail, and that's just gotten kind of cost prohibitive. So we do, um, in our database, we keep track of VIPs, you know, people that have actually made purchases of originals. And so we will direct mail to them. Um, and, and interestingly enough, direct mail is working better than it ever has. It, you, direct mail used to be the king before the internet and the internet kind of came in. But the direct mail people are finding that it's working better because nobody's doing it anymore. So instead of getting 5,000 pieces in the mail, you're getting two or three, mm -hmm. and so you're standing out more. Yeah, and I think, you know, a, a postcard with a art piece is something that people are going to take time to look at. Absolutely. So, and if you're inviting them to a party with wine and cheese. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, you know, that sense of local community is, is really important to become a known local star artist in your community. And, and to a lot of people, that they look at artists like that. They look at you as kind of a star. I don't mean to embarrass you, but the idea being that this is something that not everybody can do, that, or they don't believe they can do it. They look, they live their lives vicariously through you, and you're bringing 
um, you know, color and excitement to a canvas and how can you possibly do that? And it's a mystery to them. And so to become an artist of, of notoriety in a community is huge. And uh, to be able to work that community, and it's a lot of work though, you know, you, I'm sure there's a lot of Chamber of Commerce meetings you'd rather not go to. Mm -hmm. And we're active in our church, and we get a lot of great support from our church. And um, I serve on a hospital board. And so when we have sales that are gener generated from our church or the hospital, I donate 20% back oh, that's nice. to um, you know, those organizations and just kind of paying it forward and you know, grateful for what we have. And, and plus word gets out. Yeah, right. Never hurts. Right. So. You had um, you had some really interesting opportunities studying after you left. Um, you went to Chicago to study. Is that correct? You went to the Palette and Chisel. Well, it's not really a study, but it was a club, yeah, it's, right? Yeah, it's uh, an arts academy. Um, it was started two years after the Art Institute by disgruntled artists. <laughs> so artists were disgruntled back then too. <laughs> well, so the Art Institute had its own school, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And why did these People leave it. They didn't like what Who knows? the tradition. Was. Who knows? Yeah. yeah, I mean that was back in the what 1800s when it was or late 1800s. You don't remember it? Started your memories? <laughs> yes. Sorry, I'm just kidding. Just a little before I was born, but um, <clears throat> so anyway, the the Palette and Chisel is the oldest arts academy in the city, and um, it's I mean there's amazing legendary artists that. that been through those doors. Lots of illustrators. Um, Richard Schmidt is, you know, the most amazing living American artist. And he was president for a while and, and he actually asked me to join. We had just moved to Chicago and I'd had a, a show and he came to it and I really didn't know who he was, but everybody was like, oh my gosh, Richard Schmidt's here. <laughs> How and exciting. Yeah, so he asked me to join and um, you know, you could just go upstairs and all paint together and Richard would be there painting. And you just assume those things are gonna last forever, you know, and then he up and moves <laughs> to Connecticut or wherever well, there, he moved there, to. Yeah, this is something that I, I constantly am telling people is that whatever you're doing that's good is a special moment in time. Yeah, it's you so know, true. We're, right now we're in the midst of the largest art movement in the history of the art world. The plein air movement is the biggest there's more artists and there's a lot of really high quality artists and it won't last forever. I mean, I hope it lasts forever, but, but you know, there's a lot to it to keep mm -hmm. it moving and keep it moving forward. And here you are, you're, you're studying or painting with Richard Schmid and how long were you able to do that? I think it was just about a year, but he left fabulous artists in his wake, you know, Scott Burdick was there and, um, Let's see, Nancy Guzik, who is his wife now, I can't remember if she left with him at that time or if she stayed around a little longer and then they married. But anyway, um, there were several great artists that, that uh, were well, there. Well, there's a lot that came out of that. I know that it was uh, Scott Burdick, was Sue Lyon one of those? And Sue Lyon, yes, Sue of Lyon course, was, his and, wife. And then uh, before you was Dan Gerhardt's. Mm -hmm. um, Rose Franson, I think. Rose came Franson out of there. was there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so there, what, what a special moment in time to have been. I mean, e even any time with Richard painting with Richard mm -hmm. is a gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he can just look at something and do wonderful magic with it. And he knows me as a journalist, uh, a magazine guy, not so much as a painter. I mean, he knows I paint. And he came up to me and he said. I had no no idea you were such a good painter. Oh, great. And I thought, yes, because I don't think to Richard throws compliments around, right. you know, right. like that. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. He always said, don't lay down a stroke until you know it's right. So that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> well, he told me uh, that that's really an interesting thing because he told me that he spent a lot of years redoing his, his strokes and redoing drawings. And so he finally got to that point where he was just going to say, all right, I'm going to study it. I never saw somebody mix paint for the longest period of time. Mm -hmm. Richard would look, he'd mix, he'd look, he'd mix, and he'd do that over and over again. And then he'd go, boom. 
and that brush stroke would look like he had done the whole painting like, you know, like yeah. this, but yeah. it was so careful and meticulous and perfect. Yeah. So is that how you paint? No, <laughs> nothing perfect about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think about that and just, I try to make confident marks, but I don't know if they're always right. <laughs> yeah, well, I think one of the things that was so refreshing for me um, when I first started the magazine, I first interviewed Richard, I think he was in the second issue of Plein Air magazine that we ever did. We had roses on the cover on a Plein Air magazine, which is a little weird. Um, and he was telling me stories about all the paintings that he's thrown away and that he still makes mistakes and throws them away. And I, I found that comforting somehow, that, that we all have moments when they don't all work out. Yeah. I painted a lot with Scott and Sue. Scott Burdick and Sue Lyon, um, not instructionally. We were just, you know, up, Friends. up in the yeah, up in the studio painting together. They would do these incredible paintings, usually of the model, and then scrape them out. <laughs> just, I couldn't believe it. They were just such incredible paintings. And well, they were just not. You, they were just studies to them, and they wanted to conserve canvas and wanted to learn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Terrific. So. What do you think are, if, if you had to articulate two or three most important lessons for somebody who's, who's learning to paint or maybe trying to get better, you talked about values. What are the other things that you think are really critical to understand? Well, it's, um, you know, so many artists rely on photos, yeah. strictly on photos, and you can't see the color in shadow or in light if you're just working from photos. So you need, you need to go, if you don't want to plan or paint, that's fine, but just go out with um, something that makes color, whether it's pastel or watercolor or oil, acrylic, um, and just study and make notes on the light that's in, uh, or the color that's in light and the color that's in the shadow, and it will really enrich your studio paintings. So, you know, it's, it's a dead giveaway when you see a studio painting from a photo and the shadows are, are so black. Yeah. It's, and the sky is so bright. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's, <clears throat> photos can be a useful tool. I've gotten to the point where I can't paint from a photo. I, I can paint from a plein air study. I'll take a small plein air study and make a big studio painting out of it. But... Um, I, I think that's a really important lesson for mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. and, and if people would just get outside, I, I, we know painters, you and I both know painters who've never gone outside and yeah. painted. They've painted in their studio, and some of them are fabulous painters. But you can still walk into a gallery, and you can go, that one, and that one, and that one, and that one were painted from life, mm -hmm. or were at least referenced from life, mm -hmm. and versus the ones that are photographic. Right. Sometimes juries, some online shows, and um, again, I, I think a lot of people work really hard to replicate a photo, you know, down to the last little hair and somebody's head or whatever. And you have to make a painting your own. You know, if, if you're going to do something that's absolutely photorealistic, it's showing that you have great skill, technical skill, but but you need to make it um, a piece that shows you, shows your heart. And um, just showing your skill doesn't equate to a great painting to me, personally. So when I jury, I, I look for things that are more expressive, that are a little looser, um, that, that show that the artist was really um, in love with the image they were creating. Right. Well, a photograph has been done. And so why make a painting a photograph? Right, yeah. So <clears throat> why are art competitions important? Well, it's a way to uh, compare your work to your peers and learn from that. Um, you can see, and I don't always agree with results of an art competition, like what the juror picks. Sometimes I think, oh, this what one was a lot better than that one. Yeah. But, um, you just, you kind of learn how to gauge your work and, and how to um, see how you 
your work stands up to other artists that are. Yeah, so but why enter? So if, if oh. you're relatively new or you're not, not well established and there, you know there are possibly really accomplished artists who are entering, why bother entering? Well, sometimes those artists that aren't well known produce fabulous paintings and, you know, just knock it out of the park and win above the artists that are very accomplished that might just enter something that isn't their best painting. Yeah. So uh, it's just a way to grow and to, it, it pushes you, it really pushes you, I think, to. Yeah. Create better pieces. Well, I asked that question because it's a loaded question. I, I, you know, I have an opinion about it too. And and, and I think that if you're going to be in the game, you want to know how you stand up against yeah. other artists. And if you don't put yourself out there, you'll never know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, one of the reasons I, I'm in a couple of art galleries right now, and I've always been for the past few years. But one of the reasons I wanted to be is because I wanted to get affirmation. From that you know somebody who doesn't know me who walks in looks at a painting and says I want to own that let's put their money out that's affirmation mm -hmm. the same kind of thing is for art competitions is that you'll never know how you're going to stand up and we have a young lady who won the plein air salon competition recently who is under 30 she's a rock star painter undiscovered mm -hmm. and she beat out some very big names some very incredible names and so you never know Right. But you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to try because if you don't, then you're isolated. You've got to put yourself up against the big girls mm -hmm. and see how that mm -hmm. goes. And jurors pick all different kinds of images and subject matter and styles. So, you know, if your painting didn't do well in one show, it might win in the next one. Right. So, yeah. you never know. So, what else makes a great painting? I think that's hard to answer because different subject matters appeal to different people. So what I might think is great, you might think is that isn't up to par because uh, I know you like a lot of landscape. I like a lot of urban. So I might think an urban piece is spectacular when it uh, I like didn't urban. I just <laughs> I, I'm just totally intimidated by doing it. Mm. Maybe I'll learn a tip or two from you. I, I, I don't know how to answer that. It, it's all subjective, you know what? So you, you painted your whole life, mm -hmm. and are you still as excited about it as you were then? I think I'm more excited about it. Um, I've been teaching a lot more, and that's very exciting. I, I love meeting people. I love traveling to different places, and um, I, I learn from them. I learn from telling them over and over what I think they should know. And, and then you, know, you have to step up and perform yourself. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I do lots of demos when I teach. I, I do a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. I don't lecture. So I work one-on-one -on -one with the students, um, even if it's a, a class of 17 or 20. You know, I, I just really divide my time equally. And, um, but I demo each session. Mm -hmm. There's a bug right there. <laughs> Um, and I learned from that, right. and I'm explaining what I'm doing as I go, so it makes you think about it a little more. So I, th I think I'm more excited about it than I ever was. Uh, you're, you're an overnight success. <laughs> you've been... Overnight? You, yeah, all my life? <laughs> you, you've been working on this your whole life, <laughs> yeah. but you've recently had some pretty big things happen. You, you uh, well, one of the big manufacturers just launched two different sets of your pastels, so you have... Tell me about those. Yeah. Um, I went to the IAPS convention, um, which is International mean? Association of Pastel Societies. So all the pastel societies in the world um, can be members of this blanket organization. And so um, they, every other year they have a big convention in Albuquerque. And they have a big vendor's fair and uh, workshops and demos and so forth. And so I um, instruct there. And um, anyway, Jack Richardson Company asked me to come before the vendor fair opened to select a set of 80 urban pastels. So uh, it was really fun to go in and, and they had just launched a set of 500. And so I could just pick 
the colors that I thought would work in an urban set. So I focused a lot on the darks that I think are missing often from sets and um, colors you might need to do an urban landscape. So that was actually selling well. So they asked me to do an atmospheric landscape set. So that's just launched. And um, they shipped all 500 pastels to me and let me pick out and then shipped them back. So um, those sets are both available on Amazon. Oh, well, that's very cool. Oh. That's, that's neat. Yeah. You know, you're, you're a pretty big player when, when somebody like that says, we want to do a oh. set. And of course, you, you're <clears throat> getting a lot of notoriety, a lot of publicity. You and I met in Cuba, I mm -hmm. think it's the first time we met, wasn't it? Uh, I think we'd met at Pace. Oh, that's right. Time. Yeah, that's I right. was on the faculty But we Pace got to know then, each other in Cuba yeah, a little bit more, Yeah. which was kind of a fun historic trip. Yeah, that was a great trip. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been a real pleasure. It's oh, been fun getting you. to know you. It's been fun hanging out with you and spending time. And you're just such a, a, a rock star painter. You're oh, so, you really you. are. You're so accomplished. <laughs> and, and <clears throat> you know, every everybody is going to love learning from you. This is, oh, good. This is really so. going to be terrific. And, so uh, uh, thank you for your generosity. It's, it's been really terrific having you well, here. Well, thanks for believing in me. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I believe. <laughs> that was Nancy King Mertz, an urban pastel painting, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. And there's a special, very special, today-only discount, and you can find it in the comments section. Thank you for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes. Cassatt, Degas, these are just a sampling of the artists who have captured our imaginations with their beautiful and inspiring pastel paintings. In fact, throughout history, pastel paintings have made up many of our most powerful and truly iconic pieces of art, including the Buddha, Before the Race, and the Degas classic, After the Bath, Woman Drying Herself. Though it's not just art connoisseurs who marvel at such work, People with no great interest in art also view pastel paintings with a look of awe. The rich textures, the deep colors, all are so satisfying to the eye. Now in the 21st century, unique urban paintings are among some of the most popular works of pastel art. After all, there aren't many things more fulfilling than bringing the excitement of the urban landscape to life. In this all-new, exclusive release from Lilidal Art Instruction Videos, you have the rare opportunity to follow along step-by-step step, with one of the most talented masters of urban pastel painting. Nancy King Mertz will show you how to breathe life into a wonderful urban landscape scene. You'll discover composition tips for unique urban paintings, how to layer colors for rich results, negative painting techniques which can take your work to a whole new level, and much, much more. Learning to paint an urban pastel painting is one of the easiest ways to accelerate your learning process as a painter. And this all new release is perfect for artists of all skill levels. Urban Pastel Painting with Nancy King Mertz is now available on both DVD and streaming video.